Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Carla Brown, and I'm part of the corporate communications team at Zeebrook, and I will be overseeing this webinar. In a few moments, you will see a graphic on your screen for a few seconds, and then you will, apologies, I have to share this again, um, for a few seconds, and then the video will begin. The content has been pre-recorded, as in the presentation has been pre-recorded, to give us the opportunity to offer this webinar multiple times. But I do believe that one of our panelists or presenters, Sarah, is going to be on the call, so she will be available for the live Q&A after the presentation video has um, ended. So if you do have a question, please type it in the question box, not in the chat box, because that will not be monitored. And if your question will not be answered this session because we ran out of time or for any other reason, we will get back to you individually if that's possible. So with that being said, let's begin. Our primary presenter today is going to be Sarah Ma, who is Zeekberg's Global Sustainability Manager, and she will be joined by Alina Mom, who is the Global Head of Sustainability and Circular Economy for Zeekberg. If you have any technical problems, please drop me an email. You should have received the email with your registration to this webinar, and I will be happy to send you the recording. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Sarah Ma. Thanks, Carla. Hello everyone. Today I would like you I would like to take you through Ziegwerk's sustainability intention and ambition and how we are translating this into action and lessons learned along the way. Um, a few words about myself. Um, as Carla mentioned, I'm the global sustainability manager here at Ziegwerk. I've been with the company since 2020. Um, I'm a geologist by training, and I was working in greenfield projects, so I really got to see the impact of resource extraction and what it does to the environment. Um, I wanted to move further down the supply chain, so I got my MBA with a focus in sustainable development, and I worked um, in developing ESG KPIs for investment funds in emerging economies as well as real estate, and now Within Zigvek, I'm really trying to support driving the sustainability program called Horizon Now. And today, I'd like to walk you through our sustainability program and deep dive into carbon accounting and things that we have learned on the way, what we did right, and what we, let's say, what we wish we did. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about Ziegwerk. Um, we were founded in 1830, um, so a long history of being agile um, and really trying to transform for value um, and really ensuring that we have relevance for the market need. We are a global organization. We have over 50 sites in 35 countries, and we serve a global market with our customers and our suppliers being in, in over 100 countries. Um, we really have a global operations and global reach. So running through our action plan, I wanna to touch on the why, the what, and importantly, the how of our sustainability program. So when we think about why, why have we chosen to refocus our value generation in considering our planetary boundaries as well as um, social equitable growth? So if we take a look at the social progress index, they have a nice snapshot of the global situation. Um, we can really see um, the, let's say the differences between different regions globally and what this, what this organization does is they take 60 indicators and measure the, measure the social performance in 169 countries fully 
And these indicators range from basic needs um, to opportunity to access to education, et cetera. So I think when we think about global operations, it's really important to think about the context in which we operate. So if we zoom in here to Germany, where we're headquartered, we can see that their scorecard on this social progress index is quite good. They're ranked eighth overall, and they have quite good scores across the board. We also have large operations in India, and you can see here, basic human needs is quite good, but when we think about foundations of well-being and opportunity, it's a little bit lower, and that's for reasons like access to education as well as environmental quality. And then also if we zoom into the US, so ranked 25, quite good for basic human needs because and foundations of well-being, um, a little bit lower in opportunity. You can see high access to information. However, health and wellness and personal safety are a little bit lower. So really when we think about operations and a global context and the growing differences and social inequalities, this is something that needs to be addressed because we're not operating in a bubble. And as, as an organization with a global footprint, we can really make an impact. So this is one of the drivers and one of the things that we consider when implementing our sustainability program. Um, another thing that's important to consider is our planetary boundaries. So I think most, most of you have probably seen this World Overshoot Day, which I think right now is sitting in March. Um, but we're, we're seeing an increase in our population, especially within the middle class. And um, this is costing um, our, our planet. So right now you can see the trend line is we're increasing our demands on um, the world's resources. And so in 2022, you can see we're currently consuming 1.75 Earths per year. And this just simply is not a sustainable model. Um, the downward trend is, is something that we're, we at Siegberg note is an important trend to try and fight against. We, this is not something that has, um, that we, we will not be able to have longevity in this, in this current trend. Um, and we, if we con continue to consume um, beyond our, our planetary boundaries and our resources. Another consideration or driver for our sustainability program are policies and regulations. So not only do we want to do good, but um, when, you, when governments start to, um, start to incorporate policy, this, this, um, these sustainability topics end up on our PNL, and we can and we really see the the actual costs of these, um, and the cost impacts. Um, and examples of this would include things like the extended producer responsibility fees, fines within the upcoming German supply chain law, if you're subject to the ETS carbon markets or carbon taxation. Really, these are these are having financial impacts. Um, and so the way we structured our program were these in we, we really consider policy um, and standards, but we also like to align ourselves with um, different collaborations and pilots, as well as um, as different ben benchmarking platforms. So now if we zoom into our actual sustainability program, we've called it Horizon Now. Um, and it has, this is not Siegberg's first foray into the sustainability world. It, we actually have quite a long history in sustainability, um, but it's been an evolving history. So um, really our first, we first see our, our sustainability program, our first sustainability program in 2015. Um, but this was very much um, our first program. So it was not fully integrated into our business agenda. There were targets. We generated a report um, and some action was absolutely done. It started to enter into the conversations, but it wasn't a fully embedded strategy. Then in 2019, um, because we feed into the packaging supply chain and the packaging waste crisis, the plastic packaging waste crisis, um was really gaining a lot of 
notoriety within the within the industry. We really um, circular con. We really came onto the radar, um, and this was a nice entry point that is tangible and in the sustainability space. So in 2019, the board decided to integrate our organization with a new business model to become a circular and digital packaging solutions provider. And this was really um, where we start to see the DNA of the organization transform um, to where sustainability topics are on the top strategic agenda and they're integrated into business. And so the next evolution of this to make it a more complete strategy was in 2021, um, the, the program Horizon Now was born. And this really has a complete umbrella over all the material sustainability topics within Ziegbeck from social to governance, as well as environmental conservation. So um, it's really been an evolution and I think that's okay. Um, it's, I don't think it made sense for our organization to do everything at once, um, but take the really pragmatic and appropriate steps. Um, and this also, this let's say slower approach also allowed this the strategy to really be embedded into our organization and it's it is integrated um, onto the business agenda, which I think is is really important when actually trying to enact impact. Um, so what is our program? What is Horizon Now? So in in one um, one page, um, we basically have our, our program divided into two main pathways. We look at our operations, so how we produce inks and coatings or circular and digital packaging solutions and what we produce. Um, and we have four main areas of impact. And within these four main areas of impact, we had seven measurable targets. So if we look at area of impact number one, operation and supply chain, we have two targets to achieve carbon neutral scope one and two emissions globally, and to have 100% of our suppliers committed to the principles of the UN Global Compact. In our second area of impact, product safety and responsibility, again, two targets, to establish product environmental footprint data for 100% of our products, and to be the trendsetter for safest inks and coatings. In area of impact three, people's in, people in community, oh, excuse me, circular economy, we have the goal of 75% of all products or services sold enable reducing, reusing, or recycling of packaging. And finally, in our, oper in our fourth area of impact, people and communities, we have double the female gender representation at executive level, as well as a TIR or a total incidence rate of less than one. And all of these are on a 2025 time horizon. So in a snapshot, this is our our sustainability program. And we have quantifiable KPIs against all of these targets that are monitored um, annually, so we can really see our progress. So if we want to look at our progress and what has been done over the last year, um, since the program has really, has really um, been born, um, here's just a few, a few summary items of, of um, some of our achievements for the different platforms or the different areas of impact. So in operations and supply chain, we now have four sites that have, um, that have solar panels, so on-site renewable generation um, in India, Spain, Mexico, as well as Italy, um, and global feasibility studies for determining if on-site renewable generation can can be built, they're, on, they're currently underway. Um, in Ziegberg, our largest site, we have equipped the site with um, charging infrastructure. So we're really incentivizing and supporting e-mobility as well as transitioning some of our fleet to electric. Um, in addition, we have all of our EMEA sites except for Turkey that have transitioned to renewable grid energy. Um, and that's as of 2021 onwards and as of 2023. So this year we have, uh, we will have full 
um, global renewable energy or electricity procured from the grid. And also last year, we committed to the science-based targets initiative for a net zero target by 2025. Um, if we hop over to product and responsibility, product safety and responsibility, um, last year, we completed the exercise of being able to provide the carbon product carbon footprint for our full suite of product, our full suite of portfolio, our full portfolio of products. Um, we also, in terms of safety, we um, launched a an initiative for 100% of mineral oil free inks in India. Um, we are driving a Halloween ban in India as well as Southeast Asia. And we are continually setting industry standards as well as compliance monitoring. And what the another achievement that sort of straddles both of these impact areas is we set both short and long term targets for scope three. Um, okay, so in our our third area of impact, circular economy, um, we won eight awards for circular operations and product innovations, um, including our including Uni Nature, one of our um, inks that has higher biorenewable content, as well as PolyCirc, our de-inking lab, and many others. And that was these are global awards. Um, so really, a lot of um, yeah exciting recognition in the circular economy space. We also last year launched um, our water-based barrier coating, and this is an in-house development of a water-based barrier coating for water, water vapor, oil, and grease. And we also classified our full portfolio of products, which is over 100,000 products, and defined if they are circular or not based on a rule book um, with from with input from ink encoding expertise um, and quantified the sales against this rule book. This is an important action as circular economy, as it's in the name of circular economy, it's a new economic model. And therefore this, this um, exercise really enables us to measure progress against this new economic model and see how we're doing from a business perspective with, within circular economy sales. In platform or area of impact for people and communities, we um, really we did a large study to understand the pivotal points and the pivotal, let's say, pain points or challenges for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we wanted to understand the blind spots in our own practices and conducted leadership trainings around unbiased or unconscious biases. Um, for within the training space, um, safety, or excuse me, within the, the safety space, um, this is a top agenda item where we have continual internal audits. We have launched a, or relaunched a, a large global internal training program, as well as have very high levels of data tracking and monitoring against safety. Um, and for our social projects, we have um, social development projects globally where we, um, and one, one major one is the SOS Children, where we really try and enable a mentorship training and development um, ethos for, for those, those in need. So the how, how do we embed sustainability into our business agenda. So I think really you can look at it in, in sort of a, a sandwich model. Um, we have top down and bottom up um, pressure, essentially. We, we've designed, it's by design. So we have CEO accountability, the executive board is is informed and involved, and we have a sustainability council, which is a mix of senior leadership um, to help monitor the progress against our targets. And we also have over 40 change agents throughout the organization that have 10% of their time dedicated solely to sustainability activities, and they generate ideas, feedback, and input to what are the key sustainability 
priorities or focus areas for for our organization. So really having this top down and bottom up um, input and pressure has created this um, organizational structure where um, really sustainability is highly engaged. It's very, um, it multiplies very quickly. Um, and we really have a lot of um, strong change management built into this structure. Um, so it, it ensures this organizational transformation without a choice. Um, a couple of, let's say, learnings from this is the, the, the sandwich structure also allows a lot of autonomy. So the, the change agents have also started to multiply their own efforts through creating local task force forces and um, having sort of this top-down mandate, we really see that management is putting this into, into their own sort of job descriptions. Um, and it really, it's really a way that this is um, threading sustainability into our own DNA. Additionally, we have dedicated resources, um, which really help um, to coordinate and manage all of the, the global inputs of the sustainability program. Um, and then if we look at um, another mechanism and how we really embedded sustainability onto the business agenda is this integration of financial mechanisms and sustainability. Um, so last year, we incorporated a carbon shadow price into our operations. Um, this had this allowed many opportunities within the organization um, from a sustainability perspective. One being it it really gave us it gives us a bit of foresight into if there were changes in regulation and we were subject to let's say increased um, carbon taxes or subject to the European ETS system, um, this acts as a risk mitigation because we understand how much how much money we may need to pay into these, these sort of carbon markets. Um, it also allows us to um, manage payback, um, payback times for payback periods for let's say um, higher invest CapEx projects. And it really just gives us a control of um, how we can incorporate the, let's say, externality of carbon and really move it in internally. Um, so yeah, this was this was huge and and really um, sort of embedded this carbon accounting into our in our everyday operations. Um, we also have set up strategic partnerships with certain circular initiatives, such as Project Stop in Indonesia. Um, this is an organization that's really at a different point of the value chain than we are. Um, so it, 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 acts, it gives us so, so many insights on what is needed um, from emerging markets at the end of life for packaging. And um, we're really it really allows us to sort of close the loop on all of the efforts that we're doing early on in designing for recyclable packaging and seeing how this can impact at the end of life. And then finally, we also, um, we have sustainably, sustainability linked financing. So we have certain KPIs, um, depending on our performance against these KPIs, this will um, impact our our interest rates for our debt. And I think that this really, um, this provides financial incentive and opportunity to really leverage a high performing sustainability organization. So again, another way that we were really able to embed sustainability into our business agenda. Um, and now zooming in, I wanted to um, focus on a case study for carbon accounting. Um, I think that this is, on the agenda for a lot of organizations, especially coming out of COP27. Um, and it is, yeah, I think we, we, we did things sort of by the book in some cases and, and differently in others. And there were a lot of lessons learned from this. So um, if we think about your typical 
decarbonization pathway or roadmap. Your framework typically looks like this, where you calculate a baseline, set targets, identify hotspots, um, collect more supplier emissions, start reduction initiatives, and then you reduce. So you measure, set a target, and then reduce. But I think in reality, we've realized that it looks something more like this. So you, it's, you have these initial inputs, you set targets, you can then start your um, reduction initiatives right away because they take always more time than, than sort of guessed or planned. Um, and then you can also start to engage the supply chain early on to, to provide inputs into your identifying your hotspots. Um, and then maybe you go back and you increase your ambition um, and then you maybe you refine your baseline. And it's sort of, it, it, we've learned that it's, it's really an iterative process. Um, and that's, there's many reasons for this, um, such as evolving standards, um, access to data can be challenging or just the reality of limitations um, when, when trying to push this new model of decoupling economic growth as well as emissions growth. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's just, it's a little bit more um, iterative and maybe less linear than, than the frameworks would suggest, but I think that's okay. Um, because this gives opportunity to learn from action. So we were able to start our reduction initiatives early on, um, and we could realize quite quickly what was working and one, what was not working, um, and that was able that and allowed us to redefine our targets or set more ambitious targets. So um, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, an iterative process is absolutely fine. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, so speaking of targets, Ziegwerk is committed to science-based targets um, and net zero emissions by 2050. Um, so we, we committed last at the end of last year um, and we set both long and short-term targets uh, for scope one, two, and three. Um, and we really were able to use the science-based target initiative as an external validator that helped focus the discussion and sort of anchor our, our ambition beyond just our own internal corporate target. Um, so when we speak about lessons learned, it was really nice actually to go through this process, understand all the carbon accounting that is involved. It also gave us insights into best practices and the the best standards to align ourselves with. Um, and it also gave us visibility on our gaps. So in our corporate target, we had a scope one, two target, but we did not have a scope three target. And this really helped catalyze our efforts and setting a scope three target. And now we're actually seeing that this is incredibly relevant and it's coming up in a lot of customer conversations. Um, so we were really able to benefit from being able to use an, an external um, benchmarking um, tool to um, support our own target setting. And this was, um, again, part of that iterative process. Um, a few words on our, on our own target. Um, we are committing to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions across scope one, two, and three in line with the 1.5 degree scenario and the um, well below two degree scenario by 2030. So one and two is the 1.5 degree scenario and scope three is the well below two degree scenario by 2030 with a baseline year of 2020, as well as achieve net zero by 2050. So we wanna be fully carbon neutral for scope one and two by um, 2025. Um, and actually by 2023, we wanna be carbon neutral for scope two. In 2022, we did the exercise of baselining all of our, all of our carbon emissions across scope one, two, and three. And for our 2025 goal, what this means in, actually, in actually absolute reductions is 40% for scope one and two. And then if we incorporate the science-based target initiative, 
goals, we also have a 25% reduction for scope three in 2030 and a, as mentioned, net zero reduction by 2050. So we really have an ambitious short-term target that was our own corporate target. And this has now been extended into the medium as well as the long-term with SBTI. And just another carbon related target, um, it's around the topic of data transparency and we want to establish a product environmental footprint for 100% of our products for all of the relevant indicators for our industry. We already have biorenewable content complete as well as um, now CO2 last year. Um, and then we'll be looking at the, the, the other indicators as they are most relevant for our industry. And we'll, we'll, we will be doing this very systematically um, and, and for our full portfolio. Um, so we really have found that this is a differentiating factor because data quality is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to the chemical industry and sustainability. Um, so speaking of data and transparency and sharing, so why we really wanted to focus on having high quality data is because there's knock on effects for this. So we can really see a compounding impact of accurate data um, for downstream customers and their, our customers customers and this will enable our customers and our customers customers um, to be able to have really high quality carbon accounting. And with high quality carbon accounting, they can ensure that they have really accurate and realistic um, carbon reduction targets and requirements. So this is, again, a, a very circular process to communicate these targets more upstream and then provide ideally standardized standard data downstream. Um, and with higher data quality, you also can see this compounding impact from carbon requirements moving upstream. So um, one thing I think that's important to keep in mind here is even though you might not be um, currently measuring your, your full suite of carbon emissions, your greenhouse gas emissions, this likely will impact you and your organization. Um, so something I think this, this feedback loop will continue to increase in terms of the depth of required data quality, but also the breadth of organizations that are involved. Um, so this is another reason why we wanted to, from the very beginning, create really high quality data for our products, as well as our corporate carbon footprinting. Um, and um, continue to do so for the other product environmental footprint indicators. Um, so when we talk about data and what we're what we're being what we're able to report, so we have our corporate baseline um, and our corporate carbon emissions for, as mentioned, scope one, two, and three. Um, and you can see a breakdown here. You can see the vast majority of our emissions come from scope three. Um, with the majority of those coming from purchased goods and services. Um, this, from a lesson learned perspective, this was really where we were able to understand where we need to focus our efforts for reduction potentials and reduction levers. Um, so because so much of our, our corporate emissions comes from our purchased raw materials specifically, um, we now know that action following this is engaging our suppliers upstream and really making sure, one, we have really good data quality, but also two, um, we're engaging them on how our suppliers are reducing their own product emissions so we can therefore in turn reduce our scope three upstream emissions. Um, so this is just a snapshot of, of our baselining and I've showed our baseline year 2020 here um, and also the categories that are included for measuring our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and also in terms of what we can provide from a data perspective. Um, so we have developed, as mentioned, a product carbon footprint 
data for our full portfolio of products. Um, and even though the value chain is not yet harmonized with respect to the types of data inputs that they require for carbon accounting, um, we built it in a way that it can still be flexible um, and still beneficial for different systems. So it can slip, it can a lot, it can um, be input into LCA software or into um, customers' own home-built carbon accounting systems. So we really try to do it early and then build it in such a way that it's quite flexible to fit into different models and needs. Um, as mentioned, data is really the cornerstone for decision-making within the carbon space. And so being able to provide high quality data um, in a system that um, has some flexibility built into it was really important for Ziegberg. Um, so how we approach this, so we wanted to ensure um, the data that we have is as accurate as possible. So where, where required, we would get primary supplier data or primary data in general, um, or consumption-based data, and really try to minimize using spend-based data um, as, as our inputs for, for um, our, our own carbon footprinting. Um, because it's not as accurate. It might not provide um, the, yeah, results that are, that, yeah, that you can make as, as um, good of decisions on. Um, we also tried to align ourselves with standards most relevant for our industry. So in this case, it was the greenhouse gas protocol from a corporate set, corporate accounting perspective and the ISO 14067 from a product carbon footprint perspective. We talk to a lot of our customers as well as suppliers to really understand what are the most widely used standards. Even though there isn't harmonization, there is a majority um, of, of customers and suppliers using a particular standard. So we aligned ourselves with that. Um, we also try to ensure we have best practice. So where we don't have primary data, we have LCA database data. Um, for the most widely used LCA databases. So that would be EcoVent and EFA, as well as DEFRA for some of our carbon emissions from a corporate perspective. And then how we are creating transparency, we've written white papers as well as reports on methodology. Um, so we can not only provide you with the actual data itself, but also how we did it and going into a lot of detail of our thinking behind it. So there's this also helps other organizations maybe set up their own carbon accounting um, procedures. So now that we have our targets set as well as our data transparency and foundation set, we want to use both of these to now define action. This is what we really, this is where you enact impact. Um, so when we talk about our scope one and two actions, we have a clear hierarchy. Um, and that's because we really don't want to buy our way out of the, this, let's say, this challenge. We want to really make an impact against um, climate change. So we, we have four levers, uh, with the first one being energy efficiency and reduction, absolute energy efficiency and reduction. The second being on-site renewable generation. And these combined, we want to... Um, result in 40% of absolute reduction of our overall carbon emissions. The remaining carbon emissions, we would then use market mechanisms, so the purchasing of renewable energy from the grid, as well as where necessary for scope one carbon offsets. But even within these market mechanisms, we want to ensure the highest level of credibility. So we would use um, certified certificates where possible. Um, and making sure there's a long list of criteria like additionality, um, double benefits, et cetera. And then when we talk about scope three, um, when, when we developed the target, um, created transparency with data, we realized that there were gaps. Um, and that was through this iterative learning process. And, um, one of these gaps was the availability of supplier data. And so from this, we 
we generated um, or we've launched a supplier engagement program. And there's many additional reasons why this has compounding benefits. But one of them is absolutely scope getting and acquiring high quality scope three carbon emission data uh, from our suppliers and also engaging them how they can um, improve their carbon reduction pathways and plans. Um, and so this was kicked off after we, we realized that um, there was a gap in this, in this data availability. And this, again, um, I think lends itself to the learning of it's an iterative process, but it can have compounding, um, compounding benefits. And now we're seeing um, many other reasons why this is highly relevant, like the German supply chain law, um, as well as the, the upcoming um, corporate sustainability reporting directive, um, customer demands, et cetera. So yeah, hopefully you were able to gather some learnings um, <laughs> from all of our lessons and um, happy to, um, always happy to discuss the, this sustainability plan and programming um, and decarbonization journey. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So we have now come to the live Q&A portion of this webinar. So I know Sarah is online at the moment and uh, I will be asking her some of the questions. Uh, so if you have a question, then please put it in the question box, as I said before, because the chat box will not be, I'm not going to be monitoring that, but if you put it in the question box, then I can answer it or ask it. Okay, so Sarah, first question, how does sustainability fit into Zeekberg's other performance targets? So for example, price or technology? Yeah, thanks, Carla. Um, I mean, this is part of my job, why I'm here, is to ensure that our sustainability strategy is embedded into our business agenda and it's not a, a separate or side agenda, um, but it's very much at the centerpiece of our, of our corporate strategy. Um, more and more, we're seeing integration of sustainability into and with other business performance criteria, like price or technological specifications. So of course, we firstly need to make sure we have, we're adhering to any legal compliance, um, but then we start to see sustainability incorporated into our product design decisions. Um, and so of course, a product must serve a purpose and it must be affordable, but um, more and more of our customers are starting to consider the finite resources of our planetary boundaries and bringing products also to the market in a just manner. So ensuring that there's no human rights violations. And so this criteria is coming up and the weight of it is also increasing. So um, from a product perspective, we're trying to ensure that we're really integrating sustainability criteria along with other performance targets. Brilliant. So the next question is, um, we you've mentioned some of these actually, but uh, just maybe to go into a little bit more detail on some of the concrete innovations around sustainability at Zeekberg so far that you can kind of maybe talk to a little. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think taking circular economy, zooming in and using this as an example. So in terms of the products that we're putting onto the market, we have um we're driving innovation within the, the actual products themselves so inks with the higher bio-renewable content um, barrier coatings and de-inking primers that enable recyclability um, also increasing transparency within our products uh, within our product portfolio by providing our product carbon footprint so co2 for every single product bio-renewability content for every single product um, so really increasing that transparency, but also trying to, to drive circularity into the market, but also internally where um, we have a big effort to measure and monitor the circularity of our whole product portfolio. 
So first we need to define what constitutes a circular product and then categorize our entire portfolio and measure, for example, sales against this categorization. And then this gives us insights into how far we're progressing with this um, concept of a new economic model that is circular. So I think we're, we're both trying to provide product innovations into the market, but also then looking internally, how do we measure and monitor those with, um, let's say, with a new approach that hasn't been done before. And um, I think they go hand in hand quite well. Um, maybe one, one additional uh, um, innovation that we've done, and it was mentioned in the webinar, is we are, we incorporated a carbon shadow price into, into our financial processes. And it was because we got, we, we've tried to approach a sustainability program making sure that we have continuous feedback with our internal and external stakeholders and um, we we through this continuous feedback it was identified that some of our sustainability projects so for example on-site renewable generation they had poor payback and so how can we find a an innovative solution to to address this this challenge um, and so in came the idea of a carbon shadow price where we try to take a look at the actual true cost of some of our capex projects and trying to internalize the externalities and therefore have a more holistic business case so now projects get a subsidy if they improve carbon and a penalty if they increase or if they create more carbon um, and then this really enabled us to change the conversation around some of these sustainability projects and actually get them pushed further down the CapEx process. So I think you can really create innovations through business modeling, through, uh, through new business models, through um, product innovation, but also through measuring something that hasn't been measured before. So, and we're trying to tackle, tackle it in many different spaces. I like it, holistic approach. Okay, yeah. next question. Um, do you see different speeds, I'm guessing different speeds of adoption or um, in different regions? Mm, yes, <laughs> we are definitely. Um, and I think that it's because the market in general shapes to some extent activity. So if we think about Europe, it's it's quite advanced in terms of the ESG or sustainability regulation that's coming onto the market with um, the German due diligence law, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, the packaging and packaging waste regulation. So a lot of these regulations are driving speed of action for corporates that are based in Europe. And so um, you're seeing a lot more sustainability prof professionals coming up within cor corporations as well as um, due diligence or reporting requirements on data. And so this is driving a lot of action in Europe. Um, however, if we look at emerging economies, um, when we talk about time to market for product innovations, we, there's just a lot more flexibility than perhaps a European or a US based market that already has um, well established infrastructure. So in, in the case of de-inking or even reuse where you really need to approach the market with system change. You need multi, multiple players across the value chain to support a change. We can see that in, for example, Southeast Asia, there's a speed that they can approach this topic that's completely different than the European or US markets um, because the infrastructure isn't already established. It's just being built now. And so there's the opportunity to intervene early and and adapt it with some agility um, and also there's in these markets you'll see a lot more disaggregated players so you don't have huge players that sort of um, can set the agenda you have smaller players willing to move fast and so this race for circular economy um, this could this is absolutely not decided by a european or u.s market necessarily but huge opportunity in some of these emerging economies. 
Okay, um, next question. We mentioned obviously agenda targets when it comes to diversity. Why did we pick a gender target and not another diversity target or more diversity targets, I guess? Yeah, I, I think it's a very fair question. Um, I'm glad I have the opportunity to address it. I think it's more that I want to reframe it that gender is our starting point for the, the pathway of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but why is it our starting point? So, at least from a Ziegberg perspective, um, it's more easily it's more easily able to quantify our gender data. Let's put it this way, and so we it's it's easier to measure what the what our starting place is, and therefore understand the progress towards a target. Um, and also, in terms of let's say underrepresented groups within a workforce, why not start with let's say the biggest group? When when we talk about minorities, I don't think it's necessarily fair to say, or visible minorities, it's not necessarily fair to say that gender or females are a visible minority. They're in fact, I think, 52% of the global population. So clearly there's, um, it, there's, let's say, ample opportunity to have equal representation just from a, an overall population perspective when we talk about gender. Um, and I think another important aspect is if we think about the gender parity, there's a lot of research out there that's, that supports the idea that if you increase the gender parity, it has knock-on effects that other diversity aspects can be increased. Um, because I think diversity, it's, as a lot of these topics, it's incredibly complex. And we can see also um, this a, a concept of intersectionality. So if you have um, a visible minority who's also female or identifies in a certain way, then um, it, it can, if you increase the, I think if you use gender as a starting point, you can also have the ability to increase visibility in other, in other diversity aspects. So I think it's not a limit to the conversation, it's more of a starting point. Okay, that's well put. And then maybe a little bit of a provocative question. Um, uh, we have offsets as part of the sort of, as part of the plan and the strategy, but are offsets not the equivalent of greenwashing? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. I think and an and an inevitable one that will come up when you talk about race to net zero or carbon reduction. So. Um, I think important to define and understand what is an offset. So in general, an offset is a reduction or a removal of emissions of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases in order to compensate for other emissions made elsewhere. Um, and it's a market instrument. So it's transferable and it's traded on a market. You pay into this market and ideally funds are then funneled towards the projects that are generating these carbon offsets, whether they be uh, reforestation, carbon capture, wetland res restoration, mineralization, etc. And so they're a tool um, and a contentious tool. And I think in general, when you have a tool, they, it needs to be used responsibly. If offsets were the centerpiece of our reduction strategy, then this would become problematic because in essence, you could be buying your way out of a problem. You would just be compensating for your emissions. You're not really putting in the effort to internalize your negative externalities. Um, but luckily, <laughs> and by design, Ziegwerk is very much not doing this. We are, we, as if you can recall, we have four levers that are in a hierarchy to approach our net zero or our carbon reduction strategy. Um, and a way that we also ensured that we would not be reliant on the offset tool was we aligned with the science-based targets initiative and they will not allow offsets to be used to contribute to your carbon reduction strategy. So you just, you cannot use them and claim reduction. So um, we really tried to commit to a, a very pragmatic and yet, um, 
actually impactful carbon reduction strategy and then um, ensure that we align with this or maintain this commitment by having an external an external source, which is the SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative. So um, they're a tool to be used um, carefully. And I think it's also one, one last point is it's important to remember that um, if used correctly, they can be beneficial because they're also funneling money towards these development projects around carbon offsetting and reduction. So it is a way to invest in these good projects, um, but it just can't be, it has to be used carefully when you're talking about your actual strategy and how, how it's integrated into your carbon reduction strategy. Makes sense. All right, and then we have, I'm not sure if this can be answered at this point, but um, let's try. What is the current PPM of greenhouse gases, mostly CO2, and what is EGRIC's quantifiable goal? Um, so our parts per million, I'm, I'm not sure um, what they mean exactly by this, so maybe whoever asked it can follow up um, specifically, yeah. but um, we have established, let's say, our absolute baseline for 2020, and we've then we we've also through a formulation process been able to allocate this to individual products. So we go by tons of CO2 per kg of product, for example, or tons of CO2 per reporting year. Um, yeah. So and we have all this data for our baseline year, and we're now measuring for. 2020 and 2020 for 2021 and 2022. Um, and our quantifiable goal is a 40% reduction on our baseline year 2020, which is just under a million. So a million tons of CO2, 40% reduction from um, scope one and two, and then by 2030, and then net zero, which is a 90% reduction by 2050. So if you want to do the concrete math. Um, yeah, so the person who asked is uh, David Wimmer. Maybe, um, David, if you have any further questions or you want to follow up, you can just drop Sarah an email and then, yeah, or have a follow-up call or something. Okay, that is, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think we can probably wrap it up. We have three minutes, so we're almost right on time. Okay, so I just want to thank all the attendees. Thank you so much for your interest and for your engagement. Um, this was very interesting. Thank you so much, Sarah, for making yourself available to have the Q&A and also to obviously do the recording with me. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, so enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And um, if you want, the recording will be available, but if you don't receive it, then you are very welcome to ask me. Otherwise, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, so keep a lookout for that. So great. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Bye. Bye-bye.